Almighty and everlasting God, give unto us the increase of faith, hope, and charity, that we may obtain that which thou dost promise. Make us to love that which thou dost command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christmas hymn 109. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in field as they lay in fields as they lay, keeping their sheep. On a cold winter's night that was so deep, Noel, 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 born is the king of Israel. Well, we turn to Rolf Barlow Page's letters of Alcuin, Alcuin, submitted in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in the Faculty of Political Science. Interesting, 1909. To my wife. Preface, The Age of Alcuin has been written many times. And the Carolingian age in which he played no mean part has often been fully treated. The present work is concerned with neither of these primarily, yet both will necessarily be discussed in some measure in connection with the main purpose, which is to show how far Alcuin's life and works mirror forth his age and to what extent they influence the events of that time. The author wishes to thank his colleagues in the here, there, and elsewhere. Also, Professor James Harvey Robinson, at whose suggestion this work was undertaken. Sounds like he was his doctoral supervisor, maybe. The contents, the value of Alcuin's letters as the sources for the age of Charles the Great. Alcuin's early life and career in England, his birth and education at York, his teaching at York, his pilgrimage to Rome, meeting with Charles the Great, an invitation to Frankland, master of the palace school, Alcuin returns to England to make peace between Charles the Great and Offa, king of Mercia, his return to Frankland, opposition to adoptionism and image worship. Abbot of Tours, his quarrel with Theodulf of Orleans and King Charles, his restoration to favor and peaceful death. Chapter one, Alcuin's theological role. Let's see if I can go one more bigger here. I'm not sure I can. No, I can't. The general nature of Alcuin's theology, his attitude toward the church fathers, his struggle against the adoptionists, dogmatic works against the latter, nature and origin of adoptionism, course of the struggle, its significance, other dogmatic works, part played by Alcuin over the controversies of filioqua and image workers or worship, Exegetical works of Alcuin, their nature and purpose, the commentaries, his method of interpretation, influence and importance of his exegetical works, moral and biographical works, their lack of originality, conclusion, contents, chapter two, the social and political conditions, the papistry as portrayed by Alcuin, its difficulties, its weakness, relations with the Frankish power, the Frankish church, and Charles the Great, his ecclesiastical policy and reforms, Alcuin's influence upon these, the empire, Alcuin's conception of it, social conditions in Frankland in Alcuin's day, clergy, princes, and common people social conditions in England, internal strife, devastations by the Northmen, 
remedial measures and conclusions. Chapter 3, LQ as a teacher. General condition of learning in the 7th and 8th centuries. The educational aims of Alcuin and Charles, lack of schools, teachers, and books, a medieval library, the schools of Charles the Great, Alcuin in the palace school, the subjects taught there, the seven liberal arts, Alcuin's educational works, Alcuin's attitude toward the classics, his literary style, methods, and discipline, result and conclusions. <clears throat> Introduction. In the following pages, an attempt will be made to form an estimate of some of the more important phases of the work of Alcuin, from the traces which have come down to us in his own works and in those of men with whom he came most in contact. The principal source used in his correspondence, supplemented by his other works, dogmatic, exegetical, moral, and didactic. Where these have proved inadequate, further evidence has been sought in the Carolingian capitularies and other contemporary sources. The correspondence of Alcuin, as here preserved, includes not merely his own letters, but the replies of others, and so especially commends itself by reason of its scope and nature. In all, there are a collection of 311 letters. Now we got a long footnote. For the earlier careful edition, earlier editions of Alcuin's correspondence, see Pothast, Vegweiser. A modern and very excellent edition is the one prepared by Jaff and published by Wattenbach and Ulmer in 1873 in the sixth volume of Bibliotheca Rerum Germanicarium. G Germanicarum, sorry. This has a decided advantage over the preceding editions in that it has incorporated with the 306 letters which it contains the three most valuable sources for the life of Alcuin. These are the Vita Alcuini Octore Anonimo, probably written by Sig Gulfus, and the Vita Sancti Willibrordi, and Versus de Sanctis Ebroricensis Ecclesiae, written by Alcuin himself. However, in view of the investigations of Sickle and of Dunmar's health, the edition is soon in need of revision so far as the arrangement of the letters was concerned. Moreover, though the editors had hardly approved of the major part of the work prepared by their dead friend Jaffe, it had not been entirely satisfactory to them. Accordingly, Dumour prepared a new edition, which was published in 1895 in the Monumenta Germaniae Historica Epistolarum. It is based very largely on that of Jaffa, but rejects one or two trust, untrustworthy sources used by the latter. Dolmer has also revised the dates of many of the letters and has rearranged the whole correspondence. Okay, back to the story. Penned by the choicest spirits of the age, among them such as Engelbert, Adelard, Raydrod, Theodulf, Benedict of Anion, Paulinus, Arno, and Charles the Great himself. <clears throat> As an intimate friend and zealous co-laborer with these in an endeavor to elevate the whole Frankish people to the level of that civilization which still lingered on in some of the more fortunate places of the realm, Alcuin's correspondence with each and all of them is well nigh indispensable to those who would obtain a proper conception of the political and social history of his day. Therein the whole inner life of the Carolingian age is reflected for our inspection. The Frankish nobility, as Alcuin knew it at court and in the palace school, vigorous but untutored, the Frankish clergy unorganized, vitiated by ignorance and sloth, impelled to reform by the genius of its king, the struggling papacy beset by foes within and without, barbarian peoples accepting Christianity and civilization at the point of the sword, 
a great Christian empire in the making. All these stand out in the correspondence of Alcuin in a way that's most illuminating. Moreover, as a special significance and value attaches to Alcuin's letters by reason of the fact that he regards himself as mentor, father, confessor, to the foremost people of his time, he is soon to write with the confidence of a pope to every region, parish, and province, and state of his world, exhorting and admonishing the people after the fashion of the Holy Fathers. As a matter of fact, there is scarcely a question of the day of any importance in church or state on which Alcuin does not express an opinion. It is his sense of the varied personal responsibility which makes his letters so rich in material. They are so valuable a supplement to the other scanty sources for this time. The data for the life of Alcuin are very scanty. The exact time of his birth cannot be fixed, but it would appear that he was born in Northumbria between the years 730 and 735. According to the statement of his biographer, he was of noble birth, and he himself claimed that he was related to St. Willibrord's father, a nobleman of Northumbria. His early life, according to his own testimony, was spent in the monastery at York, where, the most, where he was most kindly treated by his masters, Egbert and Aylbert. Here, in company with other youths of noble birth, he was instructed by the good Aylbert in all the learning of the several liberal arts, seven liberal arts. He evinced the liveliest interest in his studies, especially in Virgil, and soon became the best pupil in the school. As soon as he was the recipient of an unusually large share of that affection which his master, Aylbert, was wont to lavish on all his pupils. Consequently, Albert made a pilgrimage to Rome after the fashion of scholars of the time to find something new in the way of books and studies, and he was accompanied by his favorite pupil, Alcuin. The two Anglo-Saxon monks, master and pupil, passed through Franklin, and <clears throat> such was the impression made upon the monk that he desired to remain with the Alsatian monks of Murbach. Though Alcuin dismisses the subject of his sojourn in Rome with a sh short but reverential mention, there is little room to doubt that the ancient home of the Caesars made a great impression upon him. Their journey had some noteworthy incidents. At Pavia, they heard Peter of Pisa hold a disputation with a certain Lullus. Later on, they met King Charles himself. On their return to York, Alcuin continued to aid Albert in the work of the school. Soon a change came. Albert succeeded to the bishopric on the death of Egbert in 766, while Alcuin became master of the school and was given express care of the books, those invaluable treasures which he and his master had been at such infant, infinite pains to collect. Alcuin's reputation as a teacher and scholar attracted many pupils to his school at York. Among these were some from abroad and others whom he frequently mentions in his letters. He taught them what he himself had studied, namely the seven liberal arts. Like Albert, he was a successful teacher his pupils ever remembered him with gratitude and affection. Indeed, at this place and stage of his career, his lines were cast in pleasant places, and he later speaks of this period of his life with regret. When not engaged in teacher, he spent his leisure time with his old master, Albert, whom he honored as a scholar and loved as a father. When Elbert died in 788, Alcuin mourned him with the most touching sorrow. And it may be, as one of his biographers suggests, that the death of his old master was one of the factors which determined him to go to Franklin. In 781, he went to Rome to obtain the pallium for Einbald. During the journey, he met Charles at Parma.
was invited to make his home in Franklin, and after hesitating until he should obtain the consent of his archbishop and of his king, he betook himself with their permission to the palace of Charles at Aachen in 782. He here received a warm welcome from the king and was shortly afterward given charge of certain abbeys. The motive which induced Elkewen to leave England was probably not so much the death of his beloved master as his recognition of the fact that conditions there were far from conducive to the advancement of learning. And then it must be remembered that Franklin had a great fascination for our English scholar. He was an enthusiastic admirer of Charles, whom he regarded not only as the defender of the church, but as a mighty conqueror extending his conquests to enlarge the domain of civilization. Again, Franklin offered a splendid opportunity for work as well as for glory. The monasteries had been destroyed or their property devastated. Learning had de decreased from generation to generation. The very language had been debased. The manuscripts, even those relating to the saints, had been neglected or mutilated. Alcuin, as might have been expected, seems to have regarded his mission to Franklin as the apostleship of religion rather than learning. I have not come to Franklin, he says, nor remained there for the love of money, but for the sake of the religion of religion and strengthening of the Catholic faith. Alcuin's first and most important work in Franklin was to act as Charles' chief co-laborer in the restoration of letters, a Herculean task, the consummation of which the king regarded as second only to the maintenance of the kingdom itself. For this task, Alcuin was eminently fitted by learning his affiliations with the church and above all by his practical turn of mind and his admiration for the genius and plans of King Charles. He began his work by teaching the seven liberal arts in the palace school. The pupils were the youths of the court, young men destined for high office in church and state. Charles himself and his elders were wont to participate in the discussions when the affairs of state were not too urgent. His position as master of palace school was no sinecure. He had a mixed class, old and young, men and women, all of them curious, eager, insistent, plying him with questions that at times must have been disconcerting, not least of which his difficulties was that his pupils gloried in martial supremacy of their race. I've got a footnote here. His biographer states that though he had never taken vows, yet he lived a life no less self-denying than the most strict adherent of the Benedictine rule, confer Wita Alcuini. Martial supremacy of their race and could ill brook the intellectual supremacy of their Saxon master. At times they drove him to seek the protection of Charles from their je jealous levity. Nor was this all. Alcuin was wearied by the frequent journeyings of the court, by the excitement of successive wars, and by the care of the abbeys entrusted to his charge. He was discouraged at times by the lack of books, and his righteous soul was vexed by the lax morals at the court. In view of these circumstances, the Frankish court could have no permanent attraction for Alcuin, He'd been practically a root recluse in England, was already past middle age, and must have longed for retirement and repose. He sought it in England, whether he returned in 790, probably intending to end all his days as the abbot of a small monastery on the banks of the Umber River. His hopes were not to be realized. He found himself more than ever embroiled in secular matters. That's a bummer. In the first place, he had to act as a peacemaker with Charles and Offa, king of Mercia, whose relations with each other had become seriously strained. 
Upon his arrival at York, he effected a reconciliation between these two potentates, but he found that the political conditions in his native state of Northumbria were such as to preclude all idea of repose or study. Despairing of accomplishing anything in England, he began to think once more of returning to France. Accordingly, when Charles called upon him for aid in combating the heresy of adoptionism, he set out again for Aachen. This was 792. And much as Elkuen loved his native land, he was never destined to return to its shores. After he arrived in Franklin, Elkuen wrote several letters to the leaders of that adoptionist heresy, which he had, which had he had returned to oppose. Neither these nor the treatises, which he wrote a little later, proved effectual in stemming the tide of the heresy. Soon afterward, however, at the Council of Frankfurt in 794, he had the satisfaction of silencing the Bishop of Urgel, one of the chief protagonists of adoptionism. And it was a source of no little gratification to him that the works which he had written against adoptionism were used as a weapon by the commission, which succeeded in uprooting the pestilent heresy in Spain. Just how much he had to do with the controversy over image worship, which came up at the same Council of Frankfurt, is a matter of debate. But it is very probable that he assisted Charles in writing his protests to the papacy against the doctrine of image worship. It was probably as a reward for his meritorious services that Alcuin made him abbot of Tours in 796. It is evident that he did not seek this honor. Sometime before, indeed, anxious to be entirely free from all further participation in secular affairs, he had requested the king to allow him to retire to Fulda, but Charles set him over tours in order to reform the monks and reestablish learning there. Here he had destined to spend the remainder of his days disciplining monks, administering great possessions, teaching in the school and writing to his friends when his multifarious duties permitted. In the meantime, events were happening on the continent, which gave Alcuin an excellent opportunity for the exercise of his self-imposed task of his matter. In the first place, the crusade against the heresy of the adoptionism begun at the councils of Narbonne, Radisbon, and Frankfurt still being vigorously prosecuted in Spain by a commission which Charles had appointed for that purpose. Alcuin became the head and center of the attack upon heresy. Such leaders of the Orthodox party as Laidrod of Lyon, Nefridius of Narbonne, Narbonne, and Benedict de Vanian sought the aid of his council and his pen. Then the attack of the Roman mob upon Pope Leo III roused him. He called upon Charles to aid the Pope and chastise his enemies. Furthermore, there was the coronation of Charles the Emperor, 800 in Rome. Elkuen wrote congratulating him upon his accession to the imperial dignity and offered as a worthy tribute to the new imperial power a beautiful copy of the Gospels. Not a little of Alcuin's time at Tours was spent in writing commentaries on the Bible. In addition to the revision of scriptures which he prepared at Charles' request, he commented upon a number of the books, both of the Old and New Testament. Responding, did Alcuin spend many useful happy hours and we can readily believe that he would fain have employed all his time in this way. He never speaks with pleasure of the broad acres which his abbey ruled and owned, though he delighted in dispensing his hospitality to numerous guests who were attracted there by reason of its wealth and reputation. 
However, with advancing age, the secular duties which his office entailed proved more and more irksome to him. Quote, we are well nigh overwhelmed by the burden of worldly affairs and the responsibilities of wealth, he writes to Arno. Other letters written at this stage of his career are eloquent of his desire to be done with the active affairs of the world. Sickness and feebleness oppressed him, and he longed for rest. Even the kind attentions of the king failed to rouse him, and though the latter tried to induce him to visit the palace, he preferred to remain amid the smoky roofs of Tours. In a touching letter to Charlemagne, he pled with him to be allowed to retire, and when his request was granted, he expressed satisfaction again and again to his most intimate friends. Unfortunately, the peaceful close which Alcuin contemplated was not to be his, for a most unhappy quarrel with his friend Theodol, Theodolf, Bishop of Orleans, came to sadden his last days. It seems that Alcuin gave asylum to a certain delinquent from Theodolf, had tried and imprisoned. A quarrel ensued, and both of them appealed to Charles. To Alcuin's great sorrow, the emperor not only sided with Theodolf, but angered at Alcuin's temerity in opposing his authority, cast aspersion on the monks of St. Martin's, even hinting that Alcuin's discipline must have been lax. However, it's pleased, pleased pleasing to note that Charles forgave him at least and cheered his declining years with some marks of his favor. The former intimacy was renewed. Charles wrote asking for explanation of his difficulties in theology and astronomy. And Al Kewan showed his keen appreciating appreciation by dedicating, dedicating to him most of his exegetical works written at that time. Furthermore, agreeable to Alcuin's wish, the emperor appointed Fridugus as his successor and invited Alcuin him himself again and again to the court. These invitations were humbly but further firmly declined, the old scholar pleading the infirmities of age. A little later, a year or more before his death, he took a dignified and pathetic farewell of Charles thanking him for all his kindness and reminding him of the importance of preparing for death and the judgment. About the same time, he wrote to Pope Leo III, asking him to pardon his sins. As he neared the end of life, he was filled with a strange dread of death. I tremble with terror at the thought of the judgment day, says he lest it find me unprepared. He expressed a desire that he might die in Pentecost and yearned with an intense longing to be buried by the side of St. Boniface at Fulda. He was far too weak to admit of his being taken to Fulda, but part of his wish was fulfilled, for his life went out in a beautiful close, just as the matins had been sung on Whit Sunday, March 19th. 1804. So we got a nice little overview of his life. And now this is where we'll have to draw it to a close. Nice, nice overview. We'll be interested in this from the history of theology and um, Doctrinal polemical theology under systematics and church history, actually, as well as Old New Testament. Verse 2 of Hymn 109 They looked up and saw a star shining in the east beyond them far, and to the earth it gave great light, and so it continued both day and night. No well, no well, no well, no well. Born is the King of Israel. Let us pray. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Godspeed.